Colgate, the toothpaste brand, created a lasagna, like a <laughs> frozen lasagna back in like the 80s, 90s. I don't know. That's the epitome of line extension, right? Sh- they should not be playing in the lasagna game. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to The Craft, where we explore what we're learning about the creative process. I'm Colby, and I'm a music producer, marketer, and product manager. And I'm Carter, a writer and PhD student at the University of Kentucky. And today, we've kind of got a special episode. We recently talked to Warwick Saint, and you'll see that interview on The Craft. And it was such a good discussion, and it was so inspiring that we wanted to take just a brief episode here to unpack the conversation, just kind of digest it. And so we we give a few introductory thoughts in the beginning of the interview, so you can listen to those. But this is like the extended version of how we think the conversation went, what stood out to us, and that sort of thing. That's right. And that'll be episode 42, if you want to go back and listen to that right now, before you dive into this episode. So I'm really excited to dive in. I mean, there was a lot of really big... There was, it was such a good conversation. So where do you want to start? I mean, really, I just think the big question is what, it, what were your biggest takeaways from the conversation? Yeah, some of this will be, I think, the elaborated version of what we talked about in the beginning of the interview. But for me, it was just such a privilege to sit down with such a successful artist. I mean, that was, it was just an absolute privilege to, to talk to someone who has really mastered a craft. I mean, this is kind of the zenith of photography, right? He's done it all in photography and to see how he is evolving into a new artist and to hear his deep reflections on the creative process, on his art, was just really rewarding. And I think especially for us, you know, at the kind of the beginning morning of, of, an artistic career, it was inspiring to hear not only about his career, which we talked a little bit about, but to hear the things that we've talked about, his take, and to see the the threads come together. Like there was stuff that we've talked about on the craft that he was mentioning that was just such a word of affirmation for me of like, oh no, right? The creative process is an embodied process and it matters what you do before you create your art and it matters that you went for a run and it matters, you know, X, Y, and Z and that the, the arts are not this ethereal thing that happens just in the intellect. No, it's an embodied thing. It's part of the human experience. And so for that was one instance where it's like, oh, this is stuff we've talked about on the craft. And here's here Saint is talking about it. And he's kind of living it out uh, in the wild, if you will. And so that was just on one level, it was just deeply encouraging to me. Yeah, that's really true. The some of the threads were so similar to things we've talked about in a in a good way of just Oh yeah, maybe we're onto something. Maybe we're not crazy there. You know, just there were some around process, some like you said around sort of a holistic view of your life. Like art is not just sitting down to do the thing, but also the preparation and your routines. And like he said, and even at the clip at the beginning, the way that he looks at the world, right? So the outlook on things where he can be inspired by a cardboard box. We should talk more about that piece. But yeah, you love that one. It it resonates with me. But yeah, there were just so many threads, like you said, that connected to conversations we've had. Where do you want to take this now? I, I have a bunch of notes that I scribbled on a piece of paper and I've got a picture of it that I'm looking through. Let's go there. So they're just like a lot of little gems, like little pithy phrases. Some of them were quotes from other people. Some of them were things that he said, like you're a true Jedi whenever you can change your emotional state or art is like a relationship. You just have to keep showing up or photography is a portal through time to a specific moment or that's a good one that's you a- need an angle you need a point of view to break into an industry i think that that that's a gym to like unpack a little bit what does that mean for your art and i can be inspired by a cardboard box i think that one is another so there's these little pithy phrases and there were some more that i'm probably forgetting but i feel like each of those is almost a conversation starter sure well you know may, let's circle back to the cardboard box for a second because i think that's like it's such a great symbol of kind of the broader conversation, I think. Saint talked a lot about the portal of time with photography, which was, you know, so fascinating. I mean, even if, you know, even if we go to our our vision, right, whenever we see something, we're seeing it 
not as it is, but as it was, because it takes time for the light to get to our eyes. So even even our vision is always bringing the past. It's very small, you know, but bringing the past into the present and to see that there's a way in which the past can speak to us in the present in art. I mean, is a deep and rich and beautiful idea. And so I think when we take that view of things in which that the past has something to tell us and and the past can still speak to us and it's not frozen and it's not lost, but it can still have a voice, I think that's part of, let's say, re-enchanting the world, right? We live in a world where a cardboard box is a thing that has a specific use in an industry, and it's worth so much, and it can hold so much. It's numerical, it's quantified, it costs, it's written off in a bottom line. But then the world of art pulls us out of that view, and for a second, it's something that's strange that confronts us. It's a thing in the world that has been, that 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 we have to encounter not as a number, but as the thing that's sitting on the floor, <laughs> and it's open, and there's, there's something there. And I, I just think Saint was so helpful in saying there's a paradigm, there's an attitude of looking at the world where things speak and they rush into us, right? And the past comes to us, and we don't see this alien, silent, going back to Rosa, our conversation on resonance, the world is not silent to us. It's a world that's always flooding into us, and it's a reciprocal thing. And, you know, the relationship aspect, too, of we have a relationship with things. And it's just this richer view of the world that I think is so crucial for the artist to adopt, you know, and it has social ramifications. And, you know, he talked a lot about how the artist has to do that, right? They have to get out of this normal way of looking at things because if they don't, right, we start to get this creep of everything looks the same and and everything looks silent, but the artist helps reawaken our eyes to it as well. I want to pull on that thread a little bit right there. The idea that he said that artists are like the tip of the spear and we should keep that spear sharp. And then he also said this idea that you should always be pushing yourself. So not only the artists are the tip of the spear because maybe one, they're sometimes playing with new categories. They're taking two different things that didn't go together and they're pushing them together or mashing them against each other, like he said, photos and and painting like he's doing or some other medium with another style or genre or topic. And so that's one piece of it. But then there's also the piece of working all the way up at the edge of your abilities to where you fail, to where you break a little bit or where you really, it's really hard. Like for him, he talked about the layers, right? So there's the layer of the taking the photo, the layer in Photoshop, the layer in painting and then hues and, and shades and light tones and different things. And with, he said, the painting is the edge for me. That's where I need to spend my time. I'm comfortable taking the photo. I'm Mm, comfortable on studio set. I'm comfortable in Photoshop, but I need to spend the time on the painting. And if you're comfortable, then you're not pushing yourself And so that sort of tied into me of what you were just saying, where the reason artists can play such a role in society is that they are pushing themselves to their edge. And then that pushes society to the edge too, in terms of what they're creating. And so I don't know, that was a interesting idea for me to think about almost like the obstacle is the way, like the part of my artwork that's the most challenging to me. Maybe there's something that's sort of calling me to keep Mm -hmm. working on that, to, to be up against my, my edge. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I was reminded, you know, he said something very similar to, I believe it was Picasso said, I'm always doing what I can't do in order to figure out how I can do it. And he said something very close to that. And, yeah. you know, with his own painting is, you know, it's it's trying to figure out something that you haven't done before. And so there's no, like, there's no clean roadmap to it. There's the friction of the edge. But that's where the growth happens. That's where... That's where artistic taste gets manifested. That's where the the creative friction becomes fruitful at that edge. I think that's so true. When we push our abilities, I mean anything, right? And playing tennis, it's like when you push your abilities just to what you can handle, right? That's where that kind of growth happens, and it's a place of failure. And he and he had a, he had some great reflections on failure too, saying that you know he's either something succeeds or he's learned from it. And, you know, it's, it's a simple way to approach it, That, but it's really helpful. And you see that across disciplines. I mean, a lot of athletes talk about that, right? You learn the most from your losses, this sort of thing. And he was right in line with that of, you know, we have to kind of recognize that failure is going to be part of it. 
but they it offers an opportunity for us to grow. And creative growth, I think, is no different than growth in a lot of other ways. Yeah, and I think that what you're describing, kind of what I was originally trying to say and got a little bit lost in my thought was the idea of reinvention and how that relates to society. Yeah, because yeah, as an nice. artist, you have to, you push to the edge or you do something new to push to your edge and you go through this process of reinvention and that's why the artist is the tip of the spear. That's why it pushes society forward. I think what you said was so good though. Yeah. Yeah, the artist resists the tendency to, to do the same thing over and over again. Or at least I think great artists do that. And his example, David Bowie, or you know, we mentioned Bob Dylan too, artists that are constantly trying to advance. And, and frankly, I think oftentimes when that doesn't happen, you get into, you know, I'm thinking about writers who, it, they can easily become a, a parody of themselves. And so people talk about Hemingway too, of like after the, you know, his, his decade of the early novels that were just magnificent, so Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms, he kind of falls off of critical acclaim because he almost like becomes a parody of himself and does the thing that he already did, but like just doubles down on the sparsity of the style and that sort of thing. And so there was kind of a critique, which I think in some ways is legitimate. He's not changing, like he's done that. And so then when he tries to do it again, it's almost like he's trying to do the thing that he did. And by just trying to do it and not actually doing it, he's almost like parodying himself. Or you think about that like really old rock star that's still playing the same songs that he played in his you know, 20s or something. It's like, okay, every now and then that's, that's nice. But in some ways, it's like it becomes a, a trap and that you have to repeat yourself again and again and again. And you don't have that freedom of expression. I mean, Steinbeck was always trying to write something different. People wanted him to write The Grapes of Wrath again and again and again, and he didn't want to do that. Uh, or you think of McCarthy, his early career, the prose looks entirely different than, you know, the, the prose of the 90s or the, the Border Trilogy or even the late, you know, the late stuff. Reinvention. And so I think it's a really important lesson of when, when you're not growing, then you fall into this danger of just doing the same thing again and again and again, not in a rich way where you're exploring the same subject or topic or you have an idea that just haunts you and you go back to it, but in a way that becomes derivative of yourself. That's the phrase, <laughs> that whole long, cut that up however you want, but that whole long monologue, there's the danger of becoming derivative of yourself. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You're a knockoff brand of your own brand in a way. Exactly. Mm. But then here's the thing. Like, I feel like with everything, uh, it goes back to what we talked about in the episode around commercial versus creative or artistic because nice. any artist that's successful is probably going back five albums and playing the old songs on their tour as well, right? Sure, that's, sure. <laughs> that's kind of the bread and butter, the money maker. Like you go back and you dip into the catalog and play the songs that people love that got you there in the first place. And that's true in business too. You have your bread and butter and you might expand to different things. But I actually wonder what the correlation is. Because in that's business, it's note. like, there's this, uh, I just re reread the 22 immutable laws of marketing. And one of the laws is the law of line extension, which basically the idea is if a business extends, they like there's something that's called Colgate lasagna. Look this up. Colgate, the toothpaste brand, created a lasagna, like a <laughs> frozen lasagna back in like the 80s, 90s. I don't know. That is like the most, that's the epitome of line extension, right? They should not be playing in the lasagna game. And Red, <laughs> Red Bull Cola, hey, I just heard of this too. Red Bull launched a Coca-Cola. Are they, they shut it down. You know, that was a failed product. You can't just slap your brand on something so far oh, removed so good. and have it succeed. This is a, there's all these examples in the book that they give of people, of brands who think we can slap our logo because we got a great brand onto this product that's so unrelated that they have no expertise in, that they don't have trust in. And it fails every time because they get dil they dilute what their original core focus is. And so there's this idea of just like in business, if you have a cash coming in from the same product or service, don't mess it up. Like don't interrupt it. Just like keep using the same I think it's tempting to always be like, we need new campaigns, we need new whatever. Crest is still pushing cavity cavity protection. That's their whole marketing plan. You know, it's like Crest cavity, like they don't need to reinvent that. They're crushing it and they will keep crushing it. I feel like there's a temptation to interrupt those things. And it's like, so that's the business side, right? But then it's like on the creative side, there's maybe an aspect of, hey, I'm 
let's say music, I'm good at producing this kind of sound. Do I start turning that down? Do I keep that <laughs> moving sure, and then also sure. expand? Like there's kind of those, there is a tension, even looking at Warwick's career, he was constantly expanding and strengthening his skills, but he stayed in the same, stayed in photography for a 20 year career. And I don't, I mean, that seems like a really good thing, a very successful thing. And he, 20, he's done photography for 20, 30 years and he's got a deep knowledge of that craft now, which he can then take into this new iteration with, with painting and mixed media. What do you think about that? Like, where is the line? Oh, this is so good. So a bunch of things came to mind here. One, I think in some ways, right, the change is not a total transformation. And so I think the Colgate lasagna maybe the maybe the name of the episode, uh, <laughs> but right that's that's a total transformation that's radical and that lurches. I read a great piece by David Coggins talking about design, and he says good designs are edits; they're not these like lurching transformations. And so occasionally, I think you know the artist will completely recreate themselves. But even the examples I gave, I mean, McCarthy changes, but he's still writing novels, and they're still distinctly his voice. Saint has changed mediums, but one of the kind of his voice, especially I think that interest in motion. I mean, his, there's so much motion in his his multimedia artwork, and there's so much capturing dynamic action in his photography. That's something that stayed the same. So I do think it. Like you said, there can be a, you know, there can be a muse or there can be something that just captures you and you can iterate it in fresh ways, but it doesn't mean you have to reinvent yourself completely. And so I, I do think that is a balance because you don't want to go to just, okay, I've, you know, I've really created a mastery in, I don't know, fiction. Now I'm going to go become, I don't know, I'm going to go become a painter Right. You could, that doesn't make, you that could doesn't be great, make... but the, the it's not necessarily the next step. And I think Saint's one of those guys that's, he has done one of those pretty dramatic moves from photography to his very, you know, advanced multimedia. And it seems like a really natural transition. So maybe it is a kind of non-identical thing of you, your growth may look different than someone else's growth, but it is always a type of growth. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I know there's not a, a one answer for everyone, of course, but at the same time, it's like, it is just an interesting question and, and almost a question of how, how long do you go until you need to reinvent, maybe. Sure. Like, there's the stages of going from a beginner to an intermediate expert and really honing your craft. You don't want to drop, reinvent in, in your process of going from beginner to novice or intermediate, right? But then there's, yeah, there's just repeating yourself. You don't want to repeat yourself, and I won't go any further and repeat myself right now either. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's a modernist idiom that, as Pound said, make it new. And I think deep at that idea is the idea of renewing oneself. So it was on an inscription. There's a supposedly an inscription on a Chinese emperor's bathtub that says, you know, renew yourself every day. And it's a translation, and that was kind of the source of this this uh, aesthetic movement. And so I like the idea of renewal, maybe more than reinvention, because I don't know, you're not spinning yourself out of something, but you're renewing it. Or that idea of maybe your growth is an edit rather than this lurch in another direction. And I think that's kind of succinctly what I was, what I think I'm, I'm centering around. I like that. So the next thread that pops up from this piece of the conversation, if you, unless you have something else, I think it's really interesting, the idea of how his work had a really clear angle and point of view in photography, so shifting time and the different techniques there, and then you, and motion, basically, like you said. And then you see that transition into painting, but the thing stays, this, this theme of motion and movement is evident in the painting as well. And... I wonder two things. One, well, I think what I'm really wondering or the question that comes to mind here is how that phrase he said about you need a unique perspective, you need a point of view or an angle to kind of break into your to your industry yeah. or to your genre or your medium of art, right? It really interests me because it, it makes so much sense. You know, you need, whether it's a personal story or a style or so, there's something that about these 
I mean, this is so basic to art. Art is not functional. Art is about the aesthetic, the beauty, the emotion. And, and so having a specific thing that you're known for, that's mm-hmm. just very quick hook. This is a basic marketing idea, right? I'd love to riff on that a little bit. Like, what do you think? Sure. Because it feels like that's something that, to summarize what I'm trying to say, it feels like you need a, you need a clear point of view to break into your craft and your industry. And then additionally, that same thing can almost be an opportunity for you to have a theme across your larger body of work. What do you think about that? Okay, here's the first thing that comes to my mind. Tell me what you think about this. I feel like in some ways, this urge to, I need some original shtick can be really damaging in some ways. Or not damaging, let's say dangerous. Because I think the danger is... I'm going to step outside of tradition in a way and do something completely radical. You see this really, I think, played out in the fine arts realm. It's like the history of 20th century art is this kind of movement. There's something very different between Brock and Picasso's cubism and how it altered a tradition in a radical way. And the later kind of parody of radicalism that you see from like Duchamp's like urinal with his name written on it, right? There's, there's a radicalism that propels like literally the, the exhibition of rotting meat and the most shocking thing that we can, because it's trying, I think in some ways to come at it to have this is that's that's your stick. Rotting meat is your stick. You know, it's like, and so I think there's a danger to be like, okay, I have to write poetry like no one has ever written before, but you're not going to. Like, even your your most disjointed free verse is going to be, you know, you're still within a tradition. And if you're writing a sonnet, it's like you're certainly going to not radicalize the sonnet. You have to, in some ways, find your distinct angle and voice within the parameters of the meter and rhyme, of of the tradition. And so I think it's a balancing act that I think the first kind of knee-jerk is I have to do something totally different. Otherwise, I'm just going to be another blank. But there's a way in which you can like enter into the tradition and then find your angle. I don't, I mean, we kind of talked about finding a voice, but it is kind of a complicated thing because I think the danger at least is that you try to somehow step outside of everything to find your angle. And then, I don't know, that just seems not productive to me. I hear what you're saying. So it's the, we've talked about it before. The idea is you you need an angle and then the easiest angle is shock factor. Or and originality. Then you go from, yes, originality is so much just getting into the grotesque or the just like profane or something or just being really like, bold in some way or breaking rules in a way that's just like explicitly breaking rules, but not, there's a difference between that done tastefully and that done in a way that's just like, this is not, yeah, you're getting eyeballs. Like basically like a marketing version of just trying to get eyeballs and attention in your art. And then then they're not being something more there. It's not like trying to get attention to show something meaningful, but it's just kind of for the sake of getting the attention. Love it. So that's the that's the danger. I I would agree with that, but I feel like there's a different thing. There's something else. There's, For sure, there is a need to hook people with a in a sea of sameness, in a sea of TikTok, in a sea of thousands and hundreds of thousands of other writers, other Substacks, other Spotify artist, you know, pages and songs. How can I quickly hook into someone's mind and they're like, this is, this is Carter. This is dwelling. This is what it's about. It's super easy. I think there's an aspect of as a customer or as a consumer, we need to kind of dumb things down. Right. So in our mind, there might be this super deep nuance to what you're trying to talk about on dwelling, but you probably have five seconds of someone's time to sort of such a good point, (laughs) hook them in into understanding what is this? Like, I feel like a lot of times, in marketing, it, it, I was thinking about that this morning. So much of marketing and copywriting is just less. Say less, cut it down. Mm-hmm. People write paragraphs and paragraphs and explaining what they are. And it's kind of like, just give me in like, what do you do? Like after telling me in three <laughs> sure. paragraphs, like just what is <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, like yeah. is this, and it's like, oh, you offer that. Okay, that's, you could have said that in five words and it would have been helpful. In the same way, I wonder if it's helpful to go from being known as, a sub stack to being 
the only place that you learn about X, Y, Z, you know, and having that sort of angle. And for, so for Warwick breaking into the art world and, and being, oh, motion, you know, capturing motion and capturing like that. I'm sure that angle was beneficial just in terms of like getting clients who have that specific need versus just being, oh, he does a little bit of everything. If you're everything to everyone, you're nobody to no one. Didn't he say something like that in the episode? Or maybe that was about pleasing everyone, but similar yeah. idea. Dude, that's that's good. And I think to to clarify or to to distill slightly here, it's like, yeah, you may need to break rules. And you great art often breaks rules and it's often in moves in ways that are counter to tradition. Right. So it's not that that in itself is the problem. It's this idea of like the only way I can be original is to somehow create my own space over here in a vacuum. I think that's that that's the concern. And you you followed up with such a helpful description of, okay, if that's the case, then I still need to have something that distinguishes me within the sameness. And I think that's worth thinking of because sometimes yeah. we're so intricate in trying to figure out I don't know, all the nuances of the change, but we don't just recognize, oh no, this isn't this is something that I offer. And sometimes it's simple, and sometimes it's just saying like, okay, maybe my focus can be on motion, or my focus can be on this, and it doesn't have to be this sprawling, nuanced positioning within a million. It can just be saying, hey, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I'm going to try to offer. For me, what I think your angle is, is Steinbeck, you know? I think you you are a Steinbeck scholar. And so you have this, how many of our conversations on this podcast has it even been? Oh yeah, it's like, he's a Steinbeck guy. You know, he's brought him up in 30 out of 42 episodes or something probably. So I don't know if that's accurate or not, and maybe that, or whether that's what you want it to be in the future or not. But to me, something like that is a hook into kind of quickly understanding, oh, okay. And then from there, maybe it's American literature for sure, different things, but and nuances, but as a outsider, not in, in your world day to day, it's kind of like things like that sort of hook me in to understanding. Yeah, someone. that's great. You got to have a pitch. Yeah, you have to have a pitch, though. I mean, it's like, what? Where's your scholarship on? It's like I'm not going to read you my dissertation. I'm going to tell you, yeah, it's on American modernist environmental literature. It's like and 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 giving me three names, especially as a non English major, is so much more helpful for me. Yeah, the, exactly. You know, because it's like, oh, okay, Steinbeck, that's nice. And oh. Uh, I'm thinking of California right now. I'm like, picture the house. What's his name? <laughs> Jeffers. Steinbeck, Jeffers and Emerson. Oh, no. close. Yeah, he's in the circle, but London. London. That, okay, yeah. yeah. So there we go. See, even but that's I'm concrete like, I though, have right? I like that, dude. That's really helpful. And so understanding like what are the things that are concrete that help provide your angle? Because it's important. And I think sometimes I minimize that. Like I don't want to just have a, a pitch, but you need a pitch. Like you have to be, there's a whole world of scholarship if we just take that example. Like you have to kind of put your little flag down <laughs> in, in, a, in a portion of it and say, this is what I think about. And I guess that's probably similar to marketing. I mean, you have to say, there's all sorts of things that we, we our product can do or thinks about, but this is what we're most concerned about. And that's got to be intelligible. What is there anything that's like for you or for me that, categorically or just, yeah, like hook, hook wise that you think in the music world, you know, cause I feel like the, the interesting thing is I've produced for, for a lot of friends and done a lot of different genres along the way. So I don't feel like I've, I do come back to this question of like genre and yeah, but, for yeah. my own music, it's always been an electronic, but have worked in all these other places. And so there's a little bit of just like identity crisis around that, figuring out what, where should I double down? And maybe even turn down things because they're outside of that. Well, that. You're a tricky case because, I mean, working as a producer in some ways, right, you're involved in projects that are very different. Like working with Cole is very different than the music you're making with Will. And so those are those are very different projects. But for me, if I'm thinking about you as a musician, it's like I immediately think electronic-infused pop. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a big umbrella but it's like yeah you, you love pop music and you love the things that pop music accomplishes and you've got this heavy kind of electronic influence that you know integrates with the bellion influence and you hear that in your music right with with syncopation so i think like electronic syncopated pop like i just think that's kind of what you do in my mind and so i don't know does does that sound way out of left field to you or 
No, but it's just, it is interesting. It's like, it's like hearing these things from someone else is so helpful because it's like, I can be, there's so many genres and there's so many genres I, I listen yeah, to yeah. and that my, the artists I've worked with have their own sort of mixture of genres too. It's never as cut and dry as one genre. And so then I get lost in that probably in the same way that you could get lost in the world of hun- the hundreds and maybe thousands of authors that you read, but it's kind of like at a high level, here's what you're interested in. It's like, yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good reminder that electronic infused pop or electronic syncopated pop, maybe not official genres or something like that, but it's definitely, that is such a great description of what, if I, if you just gave me an Ableton session where like make something, that's probably what I would just naturally do. You know what I mean? Which is a good place to start. Yeah. Okay, I love that you said that. This is the thing that I want to do. So like red lights going off. That's the place to start. Because if you start somewhere, then that thing which appeared simple quickly deepens and complicates. So if I start, and this is true for my academic career, it's like start with Steinbeck, this drives into California literature, drives into Jeffers, it drives into London, it drives into naturalism, it drives into right, environmental philosophy, it drives into modernism, like everything from this little node of young Carter read The Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden, that node, that Steinbeck interest starts to splinter and deepen. And so now I... I oh this might be interesting. Now I feel like I have a voice that's kind of unique because of my interest because it began with Steinbeck but then all of a sudden there are these currents different currents of interest that are meeting together and then that's creating a very specific angle. But it started yes. with just saying this is what I'm interested in and I yeah I've gone a little bit from that but it's still very much a part of my voice and interest and thought and so it's I love that you said that. It's a place to start with and begin with but it's important. Yeah, I've been spending so much time thinking about this category question over the last week or so or a few days. And it's so relevant to like what you just said. You have you you start somewhere inside of a world, a genre maybe, or a field. You pick something, that's your starting point. You dive into it, you learn about it, and then you do start to realize the nuance. And something as simple as pop, then which of course is a huge genre because it's so broad. But then you realize, oh, I really love John Bellion. Oh, I really love these specific set of his songs. Sure. Oh, who were they inspired by? Oh, you go further back in time and you're listening to different artists. And there's so much opportunity to mix together multiple sources to then create something new. Like, I think I'm just literally reiterating what you just said, but it's so good. It's just what work said too about the pushing up or the overused art critic word of juxtaposition. But nonetheless, for, for lack of a better word, the pushing up together of these two different ideas or the mixture of things that don't necessarily go together, then creating something new. Yeah, that was that was a neat part of the Saint interview too. His, his kind of riff on juxtaposition and that, yeah, it is this thing that gets thrown around a lot, but that's what kind of creates unique angles, I think. It's when you take an interest in John Bellion and then you take the experience of producing music for a bunch of different artists and then those influence how you listen to John Bellion and then you take all of his influences and they influence you. It's like so quickly you become a nexus of experiences and influences that no one else can be. And then you kind of have to self-reflect like what is that now creating? And we've talked about this with you know imitating artists you don't just rotely imitate them, but when you imitate them for a little while and you steal from over here, it's like the things that you've stolen creates a very unique uh, museum of things that have been stolen. And this goes all the way down to experiences inform this and how the artist is a holistic person. And so as you expand your reach and influences, you're being transformed always. Mm. That's and so, so when things get together, you're juxtaposing things that could never be juxtaposed by someone else because they simply don't – I mean, they're simply not in your shoes, right? You, you are a non-identical person, and so the things that you choose to juxtapose and how you do that is always going to be non-identical. That's so good. What else stood out to you? I mean, there that was awesome. That was such a great riff on finding your angle. Yeah, that's cool. The one thing I'll say, and I'll try to be brief on this, I just – really enjoyed hearing how he has his morning schedule 
meditation, exercise, getting to the studio, painting, taking a break, returning, and then sitting with the art. I love that. And I just think even how he phrased it, you know, I'm exercising, you know, not to look great and, and be buff. I'm exercising so that my body can be in the place that it needs to be to create the art that I want to. And so it's like the morning worked in service to the art. And then also it's like he just totally recognizes that it's an embodied act. And I think that's just so true. That's really good. That definitely stood out to me too, because I really do feel, I'm like on paper, I always know that going for a run a couple times a week or once a week even refreshes me, clears my mind out, gives me more energy to come back to the work. But in practice, I'm if I feel, unless I feel super stressed out, I rarely make it happen. I almost only do it when I'm like burnt out <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm broken. I need to go fix this. But so it's more reactive than preventative care, if that makes sense. And it was such a good reminder for me to like connect what I'm doing when I maybe something I don't want to be doing to the, to the goal. And he had another thing that he said in that vein about your career that stood out to me. If you're waiting tables or doing a job that you don't want to be doing, but you're doing it to fund your work and your creative work specifically, having your why be really clear is going to motivate you through those days where you do not want to be at that job. And I'm not in that position, but there's definitely, you know, ways that I, there's just things about that that resonated with me, I guess. The sense that sometimes it's not totally clear which part of my career, which thing I'm working on is the most important to me long-term. And so then it can feel a little discouraging. Like, am I, am I making progress? Like, where am I moving forward? Mm -hmm. There's this ambiguity, but getting clearer on your why and, and recognizing that these aspects of your life that don't have a sort of inherent value in the moment, connecting those to the thing that you are excited about. Your run can impact your art, your waiting tables or door dashing or doing whatever that side thing is you don't really want to do to make extra money. That can be in service of a bigger pursuit that having the end in mind is a really powerful way to change your mindset and your emotion in the moment in the short term. Yeah, that was, that was a really great point. Man, I think we've covered everything. It was fun riffing on the interview and hopefully we can do more interviews like that in the future. Yeah, that was that was fun. I, I'm sure these conversations will become reference points for later on in other episodes, I imagine. Right? It, it's, it'll get woven into the fabric of the craft here. 100%. And we're collecting a string of like, how do you get out of creative fatigue? That question specifically, yeah. it's kind of fun to look back and start to see, okay, now we've had two people say collaboration. Both Cole and Warwick said that, and I'm sure that that could be a trend to keep growing and kind of analyze that over time almost of the chart of which questions get the most consistent patterns. It was cool that he's doing beat making too, or, or DJing. That's oh, super yeah, fun. Yeah. The idea of like how he remixes and paint and photos, and then he's remixing beats as well. I love that. Yeah, that was, that was neat. Well, dude, this was super fun. Great recap. Great jam. Thanks for talking. I'll, I'll see you later. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you like this episode, please follow the show so that you get notified about the new ones that come out. We drop a new episode every two weeks on Wednesday mornings. And also just please send the link to one friend that you think would enjoy this interview. That helps us so much. Lastly, if you have any ideas for other people we should have on the show, topics we should talk about, or even just feedback on how we can improve, you can send us an email at heycraftpodcast at gmail.com. Cover art was designed by Elizabeth Newell. You can learn more about her work at elizabethnewell.work or on Instagram at elizabethisadesigner. Thanks for listening. See you in two weeks.